You know, when I'm putting a video about a studio as Firexes or designers as Sid Meier, there's a temptation of turning it into a PowerPoint presentation. And it's quite easy to do so just by looking at how much of an impact they've had in the field of strategy games. But your eyes are not deceiving you. Today we're not going to nuke the entire planet playing as Gandhi, and we're not going to miss aliens we were 99% likely to hit from point blank. Instead, we're going to explore the Caribbeans in the shoes of the most daring pirate captain imaginable. And no, I'm not going to do a pirate accent. Let's take a look! Sid Meier's Pirates was released in 2004 and is a remake of the game bearing the same name released all the way back in 1987. While me saying that the original game was groundbreaking for its era would be me quoting other people, since I never actually played the game, I can safely say that the remake was a breath of fresh air during its own era. Not only that, it brought some variation in the midst of a bunch of Civilization games launched by Firexes, but Pirates is way lighter in tone. You're not in charge of an empire spanning throughout the entirety of human history, but a mere swashbuckling pirate looting and pillaging all who stand in his way of his bloody thirst for death and gold on the golden sands and clear seas of the Caribbean. If that doesn't sound like a family-friendly atmosphere, I don't know what is. As you might expect, there is no story, merely a pretext. Your family is bad with money, and everything they have is taken as repayment, and your character swears revenge on the evil Marquis Montalban for um, doing what money lenders were expected to do in those times? Okay, doesn't have to make sense, it works well enough as a setup, and I won't nitpick anymore. I hope. After watching this little introduction, you're off to the game setup, where you can select things like difficulty, special skills, or the starting date. The latter one is more relevant than the game lets on, because each year comes with a different number of settlements and overall political situations in the game's world. That doesn't mean there's good or bad options, but it's something good to know for a new player. Right after choosing all of this, you're given the option to hitch a ride to the new world aboard a Spanish, French, Dutch or English ship. This option has very small relevance to the overall gameplay since during the trip the guru stages a mutiny and you take control of the ship as a pirate and the rest of the game doesn't force you to certain loyalties you don't want to. Actually, the game doesn't force you to do anything, it's completely open-ended. You don't have to find your missing relatives that for some reason were taken from Europe to some dingy cabins in the middle of the Caribbean jungle where they didn't age a day. You don't have to defeat the evil Marquis who did what any god-fearing moneylender would do. You don't have to do the bidding of any of the nations involved. But what can you do? Well, where do we start? The first thing that's made obvious once you visit the city's governor is that the four different countries can be at war in different moments of the gameplay. For you, this means that you are free to attack a country's ship and be rewarded with land and ranks by its enemies for doing so. The land only counts for the final game score, but the ranks come with all sorts of bonuses from more recruitment, more goods in the market or even free ship repairs and upgrades when you reach higher levels. On the flip side, this means that if you constantly attack one country, they'll put bounties and send pirate hunters on you, so favoring one side of a conflict isn't entirely risk-free. But at least you can capture the ships and make an armada in which you can carry as much stolen goods as you'd like that you can sell in ports, so what's not to like? Visiting the tavern provides plenty of opportunities as well. Primarily, you can recruit new crew members, while the bartender and the uh, lady have all sorts of useful information, ranging from cities offering high prices for certain goods you carry, to ships with either lots of gold or special crew members that provide passive bonuses on your adventures. You might also be told about the whereabouts of one of the top 10 pirates in the region, and the shadowy figure in the back can sell you pieces of maps pointing to their treasures. Once you get all the necessary pieces, you're free to land wherever and take all the honest-to-god loot all for yourself, like any self-respectable pirate would do to his fellow professionals. They really love when you do that, by the way. Sailing the high seas, two things become obvious. First, that the game is extremely colorful and really nice to look at. Second, is that the keyboard controls are designed with numpads in mind. Get fucked, numpad-less keyboard owners! Ha! Well, yeah, even you who's on the laptop right now. 
This is also a good moment to explain why the footage you're seeing is pillar boxed on the sides. Well, it's a game from 2004, so these things were deemed acceptable back then. You can find a widescreen fix on Steam, but I couldn't personally get it to work without crashing my game, so here we are. Just pretend you're watching this video on your dad's old CRT monitor right after you degaussed it and you're good to go. Back to sailing, it's pretty straightforward. You can go anywhere you want and the game won't stop you. Unless you're trying to sail against the winds of course, but that's to be expected. I have to mention that this is one of my biggest sources of frustration because the wind almost always blows from east to west, meaning you're pretty much screwed if you need to go the other way. Which you do quite often. I suspected that the fact that the wind almost never blows the other way was due to realism and my suspicions were confirmed after a short google search so at least I can't be too upset about it even if it's quite unpleasant to be essentially stuck at sea when your destination is eastward. One interesting thing to mention is that not only the ships differ in terms of speed, capacity or toughness, but also in which wind direction favors them. I must admit that I have no idea how realistic this is considering that my only seafaring experience consists of me riding on an inflatable donut as a child, but it certainly provides a bit of added depth when it comes to making the decision of choosing one ship over another as your flagship. Obviously attacking ships is also influenced by this, so you need to take this in mind when positioning yourself right before starting combat. Overall, it's not an overly complex experience. You have three different possible types of runs you can use, one for the hull, another for the sails and the third to wreak havoc amongst the enemy's crew. I have to say that having a small maneuverable ship is much more satisfying to use, but if you're not careful and get hit by the cannon fire, you're screwed and fast. It wouldn't be a pirate game without boarding and sword fighting and there's plenty of it here. It's not very obvious at first, but the actual sword fighting mechanics and the number of crewmen at your disposal are actually connected. You can master the rhythm mechanics of the sword combat, but if you attack with a very small crew, your character will be slow as hell and risk losing very easily. This is one of the activities you'll perform most often throughout the playthroughs, meaning that picking fencing as a skill is the most logical choice when creating a character. But because of how often you need to do it, as charming and campy the animations are, it can get pretty repetitive. It doesn't help that the difficulty varies from a walk in the park to holy shit levels between regular fights and the endgame boss, even on the swashbuckler difficulty. I get that it's supposed to be hard, but the huge jump in difficulty makes you shout hey this is bullshit more often than the difficulty itself. Since it's a fire access game, of course you've got some turn based strategy components, so we have that as well. Provided that you have enough crew, you can choose to assault cities and loot them of all they have. I have to admit that this aspect of the game is quite disappointing in its simplicity and lack of depth. You don't even have much choice in terms of types of units, the game just automatically assigns random assortments and the information you have at your disposal is lackluster at best. I can understand that the scope of the game wasn't to be a complex strategy game, but considering this came during the same period as Civilization 4 was released, the contrast in depth and access to information is a bit jarring. Conquering cities allows you to change the faction they belong to, this being one of the few ways of influencing the political map of the game. The other few is to help new governors arrive in cities and provide an economic boost or to allow military transport to boost their garrisons. It makes sense that you don't have much influence in this aspect, you're a pirate after all. But if you have a very bad reputation or get imprisoned, you can also have the opportunity to sneak in and out of a city. This is easily the weakest section of the game. It's boring, it's not engaging and failing it comes with a very hefty penalty of wasting months or even years of your character life and health. Yes, the health does matter further you progress since your guy becomes slower and slower the more he ages, so you really need to pay attention to it along the line. Therefore, when it comes to sneaking in cities, you best want to avoid it because of the high penalty. When it comes to the main story part, repetitive would be the best descriptor. Hear me out. At taverns or other locations you can be directed at the evil Baron Raimondo who knows something about one of your missing relatives. You might be wondering why I always say evil with this tone. 
Well, it's because the game does it every chance it gets. Pirates is as campy as it gets, so I really love it because of this. Anyway, you find Baron Raimondo, you fight him, and upon defeat he spills the beans on your long-lost loved one by uh, giving you a piece of a map. And then you need to be told that the next bit of info can be found from uh, the same guy? What? And that you need to do again and attack and defeat him in order to get a different piece of a map. And then you need to do the same thing over and over again for all four relatives, meaning you need to attack this fucker 16 times in order to complete all the four maps, each consisting of four pieces individually. Look, it's already ridiculous that you need to perform the same task so many times, but couldn't they have used at least a couple of more characters you needed to fight? So this guy knows where all your relatives are hidden, but every time you slap his shit, he only gives you a meager piece of a map instead instead of the actual location of each relative? At least the maps for treasures or the lost city of the Incas are logical in that sense, so you get the map pieces from different sources in multiple cities and from different people, and honestly, they're much more enjoyable to collect because there's some damn variety to it. Another potential goal to reach in Pirates regards the seduction of a governor's daughter. As you progress and your reputation grows, visiting certain governors can offer you the opportunity to take one of their daughters to a ball dance where you can show off your moves. Okay, okay, it's still a rhythm based gameplay and you really need to pay attention to the visual cues in order to not trip like an idiot on a dance floor, but if you can do well, you can progress in the relationship. Each encounter is an opportunity to receive various rewards, ranging from information regarding story quest lines or special items which provide passive bonuses to your character. And if you do well enough, you can even get to marry her. It should be noted that the difference between a plain, attractive and beautiful daughter regards the difficulty of seducing her, the quality of the rewards and the size of her tits. Yes, apparently this is a worthy enough distinction for the game's fan wiki article, yay! Unfortunately, there is no variation in the progress of these quests, so the order of the events is identical. The only satisfaction in doing them is the rewards you receive from them. So, as you can see, plenty of things to do in this game. But as you might guess, my main criticism is that despite the many options available, the game is pretty damn repetitive. It's also quite easy on any difficulty except the highest. I could easily start a game and immediately take down the top pirates and earn a ton of money of crew, making me able to even attack cities without feeling particularly threatened. These two things make multiple playthroughs not very viable unfortunately. For that you either provided so much content that you could barely scratch the surface on each session, or the difficulty was so high that it challenged the player's skills and Sid Meier's Pirates has neither of these qualities. But the game is an enjoyable experience despite the harsh stroke I'm painting about it, and has plenty of charm to it as well. It's certainly one of the best games in which you can play as a pirate and isn't a grindy MMO. The stylish art direction makes it so that it's still a looker despite its primitive graphical quality, and the music is quite enjoyable to listen to even if the sea shanties are just gibberish and not genuine pieces. I just wish its songs were longer, because they do indeed contribute to the cheery, campy atmosphere. And I wouldn't be forced to find music from some other source. Therefore, would I recommend it? Well, considering it's just $10 on GOG, I would say it's not a bad purchase to make. Despite the genuine criticism I can address to its variety and replayability, it provides a very laid-back experience that's very fit at the end of a very busy workday. And at least until you see all the game has to offer, the game's world has a lot of interesting things to provide, so it's certainly worth the time spent on it. With that being said, thank you for sailing alongside me. If you want to hear more tales from yours truly, don't ye forget to like this video and subscribe to my channel so you won't miss out on my future content. And until next time, cheers mateys!